Hello, everybody. Happy Thursday. So uh, recently, um, you guys have been very intrigued by like what I call um, the you guys have been very teaching you how to fish segment. So today I'm going to continue that a little bit. I'm going to go into some a uh, couple of slides on how to read markets and options and spreads and which analysts to listen to and what to take with a grain of salt and what you can use yourself. So the only thing I ask is if you learn something you and you're not subscribed, subscribe. And if you if you learn something new, uh, hit the like. And I guarantee you, every single video I do, no matter how knowledgeable you are, you will learn something new. So let's jump in. And of course, this is edutainment and the story today. Well, we just jump in. One of the most exciting things that happened came across my desk last night, late. And a big thank you to Sanjay for doing this. Was this now? This is from CryptoQuant, and they say that the early bull is here. This is their CryptoQuant on-chain bull bear market cycle indicator. You can see the different colors at the very top. Red is overheated. Yellow is bull. Uh, green is early bull, and we are in that early bull stage right now. And then you've got the bear and the extreme bear. And we had literally, what's interesting, very little time in the bear, and it was all extreme bear. So it's flipped from blue, tiny glimpse in red, and then straight to green. So I don't know how much you can take this to the bank, but CryptoQuant are pretty good. And what they do look at is on-chain profit and loss index, their bull bear market cycle indicator. And uh, there is no discernible indications as well that Bitcoin whales and long-term holders are sending coins to exchanges to put pressure on the price, which is extremely positive. Again, as I've been saying for quite a time now, like a month, all cohorts are stacking. Nobody is dumping, with the exception of maybe miners to sell to cover expenses. So that is the hopium news for today, but you know what? After Bitcoin being up 40% in a few weeks, maybe maybe there's a lot of truth to this. So we'll see. Now, in addition, more bullish news is Calio. He has nearly 400,000 Twitter followers, and he believes Bitcoin will hit 30,000 by February 2023, which is big based on his fractals. And he is a fractal expert. So again, more hopium, but who knows? But after the move we had... I always talk about steps and how things have gone up in steps. You can see very clearly from his chart, actually, I'll show it again. The first step in green, where we are and where we're languishing right now a little bit, you know, still hovering at that 23,000 level. And maybe the next run could just happen in a few days or a few weeks. But Feb is not far away, considering it's the 26th of January right now. So again, more goodness. In addition, let's go through some other data which looks back at history this is 2021 versus 2022 2021 is in gray 2022 is in green the cumulative value transacted over bitcoin this is a report from fidelity and you can see bitcoin has been slow and steady over time it has tailed off a little bit in december compared to 2021 but 2021 was a very volatile period this time of year we just hit the November numbers uh, a month earlier. So that is, again, more positive information around the Bitcoin network. In addition, a little bit more on Bitcoin. Bitcoin dominance, you can see here, Bitcoin dominance is in painted in orange. Ethereum is in blue and general crypto is in gray. And if you go all the way back to 2018, remember January 2018, that was after December 2017 when Bitcoin took a dump. That last week of 2017 was nasty. and But that's also when Ethereum took a big run as well. They were kind of out of sync. But overall, if you go back to January 2018 to today, the dominance is still there, hovering between 40 and 50%, which is, again, another positive. Bitcoin is the 800-pound gorilla, and it's here to stay. Let's talk now, the part of the topic today, is to look at some options action. You know I look at it a lot. But we'll dig in a little bit better and go to different places to see exactly what type of story it's telling us. So first of all, this is the Bitcoin options market from Glassnode, and it's CME options market in the black line on the right. And what you can see from this is we just hit the Bitcoin open Options, open interest, hit an all-time high, everybody. Now, this is typically representative of big money coming in to hedge positions or speculate on positions. And again, that is an extremely bullish sign. 
But is that all? I don't know. Let's go a little bit deeper. Let's look at the options skew. You've seen this chart many, many times for me. This is all uh, platforms like Deribit, etc. Out to March 31st, 2023. And the couple of things you can take away from this is number one, Look at that big spike up there at around $31,000. And this is confluent with what Calio said in February of Bitcoin going to 30,000. So I always like to try and identify patterns and charts and alignment. I don't know if Calio is looking at this. Who knows? Let me know if you are out there. But what's also interesting though is the put call ratio is 0.35. All of the bets are up and to the right, north of the strike where we are now. And that is an extremely positive sign. So for those bears sitting in their caves thinking, oh, we're going to go a lower low, etc. We're going to go to 10,000, 12,000, 9,000, 3,000, whatever the number is, below 15,000. This is the smart money and they are not betting on that. Let's talk about this one. This is Deribit. This is the option, options open interest by strike price on Deribit. Also extremely bullish, just one exchange. Again, look at that big spike at 30 to 31,000. Now it, there's about 345,000 contracts in place and fueled by CME having 14% of the market. And look again, just to highlight all those bullish calls at between 28, 30, dollars strikes. Again, extremely good. There are some people still betting out to 5,000. 8,000, 10,000, but uh, they will probably expire worthless, barring any black swan, of course, which could take us all down. In addition, speaking of Deribit, they are moving to Dubai, the Bitcoin Options Exchange. I think they're in Panama right now, and they are going to re-register in the third quarter and move to Dubai. And Dubai is setting themselves up to be the crypto capital of the world, the financial mecca for crypto. So good on them. Um, in addition, related to this, and things moving around. Mark your calendars. Again, this is very, very important for Bitcoin. The crypto giant Grayscale, Grayscale is looking to face the SEC in court to, again, try to push them to convert the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust to a spot ETF. And the court date is scheduled for March the 7th, 2023 at 9.30 in the morning. And uh, one of the things that they really want to try and stress in their remarks, I think, is had the SEC approved the spot Bitcoin ETF, it would have allowed Grayscale Bitcoin Trust to convert into an ETF. And then a lot of investor harm that you see in the crypto world would have been prevented. And a lot of these investors would not have gone offshore to risky exchanges and gotten caught up in some of the shenanigans that have taken place in 2022. So I think that is a very fair argument. And of course, when you look at Gary Gensler and how much in bed he was with, you know who, SBF from FTX, he doesn't really have any compelling arguments to fight against this anymore. I think the Grayscale are taking the right stance. Good luck, Sun and Shine. Um, <laughs> I still think you probably need to flip Grayscale into like a fidelity and have them argue for you. Anyhow, let's talk about Ethereum because the grayscale is also somewhat related. But the is, question is, will 2023 be a bigger year for Ethereum ahead? Again, this report is also from Fidelity. And of course, we know last year they moved to proof of stake. Uh, stake ETH is still a liquid. Shanghai will allow withdrawals in March and people are expecting a little dip in price. But the question is, what will the validators do? Will they run for the exits? We don't know. We have to wait and see, but be careful. It could be worth a little hedge there. Um, let's talk about Ethereum options action. See if there's anything we can read into this one. Well, look at this. The put call ratio is not 0 0.35 like it was for Bitcoin. It's 0 0.16. And if that is not the most bullish thing I have seen on an option skew in quite some time, well, there it is. And even if you look at the bets, there's a ton of Ethereum bets north, not only north of 3,000, but north of 3,500, which is stunning. So people are extremely bullish. Again, this is just for March 2023 and all options exchanges. Big, big, big bets. Nobody is bearish on Ethereum, which is kind of staggering. So, and of course, as Ethereum rises, so will all the, all the other layer, layer ones. So can we get back to a $4,500 Ethereum? Well, these people here are making that bet for March 2023. Now, 
C5 failures will boost DeFi, um, but the yields lag again, another element which is kind of interesting. But we were one of my predictions for 2022 was DeFi, like DEXs, would really take over and be on par with centralized exchanges. They're really just getting to their to that level now, and a lot of people are using them, expressing interest, a lot of really good perp platforms, uh, derivatives platforms, options platforms for crypto, and all decentralized in nature. But the question is, can we trust them yet? We know we can't trust CeFi, but maybe there'll come a time where we can trust DEXs more. And that is kind of the big thing here. But the yields are very much lagging, what you can get on a treasury. Uh, one of the things that Fidelity showed here is a three-month T-bill rate in dark blue is about 4.5%, whereas the yields you can get on Aave V2 are about just under 1.5%. So that part of the DeFi world is lagging. And it's funny because when there was no yields to be had on treasuries, people went to DeFi. And that caused part of the problem too. So hoping for a more balanced world as we go forward. In addition, stablecoin usage hits all-time highs. Nearly $8 trillion in value was settled using stablecoins on blockchain networks in 2022. That is stunning. And people prefer dollar-based stablecoins than anything else. So that is actually, when you think about the US government and treasuries and keeping the dollar strong, they should really be embracing stablecoins more than they are right now. So hopefully they'll clean up their regulations sometime in 2023. Um, in addition, let's dig into another thing of how to read markets. And again, once again, thank you, Sanjay, for this one. This is from Keiko Research. And they looked at the big spike in bid-ask ratios. Uh, typically, they're about 1% between Binance, Bybit, Coinbase, and OKX. But look at the spike in Coinbase. And this goes into kind of some of the weird stuff that's happening. And it posed a whole bunch of questions in my mind. One is, why is Coinbase so greedy? And why is there such a huge jump on Coinbase? Granted, it's only for the 24th of January, but its volume of bids is now nearly double the volume of asks. And this could signal institutional demand. And Aptos is up nearly 200% of the past two weeks, 400% year to date. And as the network hit 35,000 daily active users on 21st of January, does it mean it is now the most valuable network after Ethereum? The answer is no, but what's going on behind the scenes? This is what we need to know. So before we jump into more Aptos stuff, we're gonna talk about this because related to Coinbase, they were hit with a fine in the Netherlands. The Netherlands bank imposed an administrative fine of about 3.3 million euros. And uh, it was because Coinbase provided crypto services in the Netherlands in the past without registering with DNB, which is in non-compliance with the law. And of course, the Dutch and many European countries are very much afraid of money laundering and terrorist financing and that type of stuff. Slap on the wrist for Coinbase, but it gets back to Coinbase as well. Before we get into the Lido stuff, Lido is no longer the 50% plus heavyweight on Ethereum staking as we go forward. Look who has emerged as a big heavyweight. Yes, it's green and it's Coinbase. But what's also interesting to know is not only how big Coinbase is, but when you look at the actual fees, the commission that they take is 25%, whereas everybody else is around 10%. So again, Coinbase are making commissions. And the reason I say all of this too as well, this could bode well for Coinbase earnings because they're making so much commission on staking. They're making so much money on spreads, you know, could be could be good for the stock for earnings, not financial advice, but it'll be interesting to watch. So let's get back to Aptos and what the heck is going on. So this is a beautiful little map of institutional trades of $250,000 plus buys and sells indicated, and that's at least 250 k It could be a million dollar, $5 million, but these are just the least amount. And the question is, is this a pump and dump scheme? And who is behind it? And this is what I want to make the audience here aware of. Again, if you look, all of these were all executed on Binance and they've been skewed heavily towards buys. About The average buy size is about 2.8 million, I think, as we go forward. But what is happening? And look at the way they, the greens, the buys happen early. And then all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of reds. 
Well, let's break this down a little bit further and see what's going on. So I put together the second chart, but I added a little dump truck to it. So if you look at all of these days from January 11th, 12th, etc., up to the 25th, you can see the buy is the green block and the sell is the red block. And there's only five days of buys and eight days of dumping. So what they are doing typically is the big institutions or whoever is manipulating this game, whatever whales, they're getting in early, buying big chunks, drives up the price, gets retail excited, retail chase, and then they dump on retail. Here, the chart looks like this. Now, it has been very, very spectacular, but this is something, you know, I always said last year or the year before, I can't remember, it's been two years now, don't chase, replace. But if you look at the Aptos gainers in 17 days, 400%. But you can see now it looks very, very toppy. Can it continue? And uh, no, when you look at the fully diluted market cap, did a full video on that yesterday and on Saturday. This is insanity. And this stuff is happening all the time in crypto. So just be careful out there. Understand that there's big whales manipulating markets behind the scenes. Next, let's switch gears and talk to about crypto. <laughs> blah equities for a second, not enough coffee today. Uh, hedge funds are now net long stocks for the first time since early 2022. That is very, very positive. This chart here shows it that they have flipped over from uh, long short to more long than before. And why is that important? Well, a lot, I think when you, when you look back and if you follow this channel, you know, once we hit that 3,500 for the second time, that was like the double bottom. And everybody thought, oh, recession's coming. Let's just sit on the sidelines, $4 trillion cash on the sidelines. Big asset allocators weren't allocating to the equities. This changes everything. And now everybody was talking about, well, oh, S&P 500 in 2023 will be terrible. It'll probably go under 3,000. It's going to be the worst ever. Many so-called experts were actually saying that the S&P 500 will not accumulate any gains for the next 10 years. Well, this is <laughs> now very, very different. Here, you see hedge funds going long, and then the institutional investors will follow. But it's very happy for me to see a lot of retail investors getting in early before the hedges and the institutions. Now, we still have some players out there that are trying to talk down the market because obviously they got into big short positions. People like Jamie Dimon were predicting massive hurricanes uh, at the bottom when it was at 3,500, 3,600. Now this guy came out, uh, what was his name again? Uh, Marco Kalanovic, I think. He said, brace for correction, for hand hard landing. The world is going to end. So again, I don't know. And then when you look at the hedge funds going long for the first time and, you know, a year is pretty impressive. So the question is, where are we going to go? But I don't know. But the scuttlebutt I hear out there on Wall Street with all the analysts, they thought, oh, maybe, maybe S&P 500 could hit 4,000. It's above that right now. Now they're all talking about 4,200, 4,500, 4,600, 4,800. So everybody's upping their estimates because they believe earnings aren't as bad as they could have been, and a recession may not hit, which is interesting. And Jamie Dimon might be on the wrong end of that trade. Let's talk about Tesla earnings. I covered that a lot with a lot of tweets and activity yesterday. But here, just to put things in perspective, and uh, big congratulations to everybody who bought the dip on Tesla. It is the most transformative company of my lifetime, and I've seen quite a number over the years. But... Uh, they do expect to achieve at least 50% annual growth in vehicle production and deliveries over a multi-year horizon. Same thing they stressed last quarter and the quarter before, although not necessarily on a yearly basis. But this beautiful little chart here shows you in this decade so far, their CAGR combined annual growth rate is 64%. And there's no signs of slowing. In fact, if you listen to the earnings call yesterday, which I listened to twice to be able to pull everything from it, they said they're going to make 1.8 million cars. So talk about sandbagging, because they're already at a production scale of 450 a quarter. Multiply that by four, you got the math. So I think they could easily, barring any wars, etc., huge supply chain issues, um, they could be on target for 1.9 to 2 million cars, which would blow Wall Street estimates out of the water. And another quick reminder why it is the most transformational company. 
Another beautiful little chart here to put things in perspective. Tesla, this is how fast these companies grow once they hit $10 billion. And then from that mark, performance over the next five years, you can see Microsoft between 97 and 2002, uh, they hit 28 billion after hitting 10, but it took them five years to go from 10 to 28 billion. Google, 38 billion. Amazon, 48 billion. Amazon's a very different kettle of fish, though, and, you know, they're selling stuff. So measuring the revenue is a little bit misleading. Apple, 65 billion. Facebook, 71 billion. And now we have Tesla, king of the hill, between 2017 and 2022. They hit 81.5 billion. So again, it is the fastest growing company out there with margins that are competitive with SaaS software companies. Now, in sad news, for those of you who know Rolls-Royce, um, a very famous brand, this article just came out, literally minutes, <laughs> Sanjay shared it with me, but I call it Another Car Maker Bites the Dust, a uh, Financial Times article. And this is the CEO, I don't remember his name, I'm afraid, uh, Maybe it's Tufan Ergenblick, uh, something like that. Anyway, uh, he said, every investment we make, we destroy value, he told employees, adding that financially, we underperform every key competitor out there. And this is very candid feedback from the CEO. But the two key words right there you see in the title, burning platform. They are burning through cash. And this, we're going to see a lot of this over the next eight years. We're going to see... Ice manufacturers, traditional car makers, incumbents, whatever you want to call them, just going to hit the dust day after day after day. They're not going to be able to keep, compete. And it'll be Tesla and BYD and maybe some new third up and coming company. And that's it. And the rest are all going to suffer. Nobody can compete. In addition, let's talk about S&P 500 earnings because we were talking about stocks for a second. Uh, here, um, all markets face a similar hurdle when it comes to central banks bent on tamping down inflation, but the earnings have been holding up pretty well so far. So if you look at the pink here in this chart, this is the S&P 500 index positive surprises. It's higher than it was back in 2014, 2015, 2016, similar to 2018, better half of the year 2019, better than 2020. Of course, we know what happened there. So things aren't that catastrophic. Of course, there was a big rebound to the reopening after COVID in 2021. But this lag effect, uh, the question is, how far will the Fed's tightening slow down the economy? Like even people, best capital allocator on earth, Elon Musk, he is suffering from debt financing bills. Okay, <laughs> he's soon to be again, the richest man in the world. But if he has struggles, raising money and financing debt. What do you think the average business on the street does? The average S&P 500 company does. This is a concern. This could hit earnings this year in 2023. Finally, final little story of the day. Interesting short, interesting research. You know, how to read markets. This is a report from the Hindenburg. And uh, over the last 24, 48 hours, they have become famous for shorting Adani. Adani is a huge conglomerate out of India, and uh, the Adani is the third richest man in the world. And they call it the largest con in corporate history. They've been researching this company for two years, and they found tons of evidence that Indian rupee 17.8 trillion of, you know, the two, that's about $250 billion, I think, approximately, has engaged in brazen stock manipulation and accounting fraud over decades. And Gautam Adani, the founder and chairman of the group, has amassed net worth of $120 billion, making him the third richest man in the world. And he added over $100 billion in net worth to himself just over the last three years through stock price appreciation across seven key listed companies. Uh, but they've gone deep, they've gone hard, and they're very confident there's a lot of fraud there. So I looked at the stock. If there was, you know, there's so many different units, very, very difficult to see if it's at a short because it has been trickling down about 20% over the last couple of months. But if you look at the bond market, the short seller Hindenburg uh, has gone after them. And ever since their release, you can see this is the dollar bond. Some of them are way out into the future, like 2027, 2026, 2039, 2030. But they have impacted the price of these bonds in a big way in a short window of time. Again, where there's smoke, there's fire. And uh, it has definitely rattled the markets. And 
as you can see, these Adani bonds have sold off hard. And of course, the Adani Corporation is not very happy with this. So it'd be great to do that type of thing. Final, final piece of news. I forgot this one, one little, little story. This is the China reopening effect on global GDP copper prices. That is the little white line to the right. It has shot up. So as China has reopened, copper has risen sharply. And that is what they call the China reopening effect. Now, what's notable, though, if you look at this chart also, um, we haven't seen that translate to energy prices, oil prices. That's an orange. And that means the global recession could be in play. Things are still slow from an oil consumption perspective. And even with China reopening, uh, we'll see where it goes. But for those who are trading copper, at last it's pumped. I mean, with all the electrification of the world, it's amazing copper is still so cheap. Anyway, that could also bode bad for inflation as we go forward though. So hope you learned something new. I guarantee you did. Hit the like, subscribe if you haven't. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to the mods in the chat. And happy Thursday. See you all tomorrow. Bye.